tonight we have a very special guest. And she will be talking to and telling us about what needs to be improved as well as what exists in the world of sexuality. Okay, listen, I read all of Julie's book. And now uh, the thing is that um, it's going to be a very interesting conversation. And today is the birthday of Mary Magdalene. Oh, well, happy birthday, Magdalene. <laughs> Do you know that? I tagged you in a post on Facebook today. Okay, you know I don't get on Facebook unless I'm posting stuff because, you know, I'm talking. Okay, so uh, today is Mary Magdalene's birthday. So it's a very special uh, energetic signature. She's the patron saint of whores. Mm -hmm. She's the patron saint of um, tantric alchemy. So we are speaking on a very precious day. The, the reason I invited her um, to the show is because I really want to get her personal. I mean, I want to know her personally as a woman. And I want to know her perspective and where she gets all this um all this ideas and, and where her research comes from about sex not being um Basically, about I, sex work not being neither sex nor work and um that's that was my main um so my my main thing is that yes patriarchy has subverted uh, the concept of prostitution but it was something else, right? So trying to un explain that to her is going to be, I don't know, maybe she's off the mystical bench, maybe not. So we don't know how to deal with that. I've, I've got all kinds of notes written down, especially where I felt that it was relevant mm -hmm. to uh, basically explain, understand what she uh, is talking about, okay? Um, so her thing is that the human touch has become toxic in prostitution. So my my teaching is the, the power of human touch. Mm -hmm. So patriarchy has taken the power of human touch and completely perverted it. That is why the concept has been so vilified. Yes, absolutely. Right? Exactly. So Talk to her. I, I don't know what kind of um like what whether she's mystically bent or whether she you know wants to hear a different opinion because she sounded pretty fixed on her ideology which is relevant absolutely I read her book completely so I went through uh I understand what she's saying about trafficking about the the condition but and I am not up for legalization. I'm up for decriminalization where women get to choose what they want to do, not in a large group, but personally. Mm -hmm. So what is your stance on this? That is my stance on this decriminalization completely. Because yeah. it's, so it's I, do not, uh, agree not with state uh, I do not agree with state interfering in this whole process. I do there should, could be a tax. Uh, but decriminalizing it makes it just like any other business. Okay. So legalizing it is something else and decriminalizing it is something else. So legal brothels are not working is what Julie is saying over and over again. It's ab she's absolutely right. I agree with her 100%. I agree with her 100% because I've been at the brothels twice. And I almost wanted to kill the people there because I have never been treated so fucked up in my life. Another thing is that when she another very relevant point is the like the the Nordic model where you uh, criminalize the buyer. Mm -mm. So I think that is one of the main things she is pushing the Nordic model. So what yeah, are we gonna go? No, that's where we're all. I I want to get her, and then I want to go ahead and 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 start the um questioning and and our own opinions there each person has an individual opinion my opinion is based on my own experience and as an active current sex worker i'm 
and not coming from someone who's researched it and not coming from this other one, I know what myself and my sisters in the sex work industry, and we, uh, where there is, there is bad people, but there's bad people that everywhere. We can't say that all police are the same as yeah. the guy that that, 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 that because it is become such okay. a commodity because the okay. my main understanding of legalized sex work is that you know in a state run brothel the girl can't say anything the prostitute becomes uh, forced to do things she doesn't want to do whereby human touch becomes toxic exactly. so how far are I think that instead of criminalizing the men, the men need workshops. Do you agree that no, the men need I don't, workshops? I don't, I, don't, I don't agree with that. What do you think? I don't agree with that. Okay. Hi, Jill. How are you? I am good. How are you? Here, the papers. Hold on. Hi, Tina. Hi. How are you? Good. Where are you in India? Bombay. Nice. Very nice. Okay, we were just discussing a little bit of um, Jill's book. And um, I, the only, I, I disagree with um, Tina thinks the men should have workshops. I, I, I tend to disagree with these workshop deals if it's, if it's based on them being caught and, and, and penalized because that's causing a lot of broken homes, a lot of poverty. The man no longer has a job because he gets fired. All this, uh, the Nordic model, I, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with they should get workshops. I think that um, if they're going to get workshops, I think um, it'd be better if they did it on their own, not mandated by the government. Yes. Not, the government should not interfere. I completely agree to, with that. Welcome back to Kiara Nation. So are we not going to... Today order? we have a very special guest who is honoring us, um, Julie Bindel. Hi, Julie. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Hi. Julie's a journalist, activist, feminist, and I'm very happy to have her here. My two co-hosts, is one is Tina from TinaHeals.com. Tina is a Bollywood writer. She's an astrologer, a tarot card reader, and a female history researcher. We have Jill McCrackeran. I'm sorry if I say it bad. <laughs> She's a PhD professor of English, women, and gender studies, director of the Masters of Liberal Arts, at the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg. Welcome ladies, thank you. Today we're gonna discuss The Pimping of Prostitution um, by author Julie Bindel. I, am, I was an opponent, or um, not so much an opponent, I was a little offended <laughs> by, um, by the book and I made my offense known by um I, we created a video with my co-host no 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 we, we don't want legalization or the swedish model we want full decriminalization like new zealand tell the candidate we have 17 sex worker organizations ready to endorse her if she advocates full decriminalization what consenting adults do in the privacy of their own bedrooms or dungeons is none of the government's business. Get the government out of my womb and out of my dungeon. Hi, Julie. Yes, Gabriel. Hi, I'm, I'm here. I'm going in. If you don't hear from me in 15 minutes, call the cops because her pimp has come and is probably beating up her and me and taking us captive. Good luck, Gabriel. Be safe. And producer at the time and well, it didn't sit down with me well because I'm a person who believes in understanding, not tolerance, because tolerance, anything 
you tolerate or break at any point. You can put a stick underneath a ceiling that's falling. At some point, it, tolerance will break. So it's understanding is very important to me. So I wrote a uh, email to Julie telling her how I felt, and she responded very, very warmly, very wonderfully, and um, accepted to be on this program, on my on podcast, um, and video blog and I thank her I thank her from the bottom of my heart and I hope that we discuss and and come to an understanding because not everything um, Julie says is not untrue there's a lot of truth in her book and we're going to discuss that but there's also certain things that I, I would like to set right as a current and active sex worker thank you Julie, tell us about yourself, please. Well, first of all, Kiara, thank you so much for inviting me to talk with you and your colleagues. And it's a real pleasure to meet you all. Um, I was born in the northeast of England in a very working class, quite impoverished community. Um, and I grew up um, in my teenage years as a lesbian who was really worried about coming out in those circumstances, as I'm sure we all appreciate. You know, I'm 58, so this was in the mid 1970s and in, in a bit of an unforgiving community. And I moved away from home to find work and to find other feminists because I'd grown up with brothers and a father who were quite traditional. And I could see that women didn't have a great future for, uh, you know, for ourselves staying in that community. And I found feminists in a city called Leeds, which is in a place called uh, West Yorkshire in England and at the time that I moved there at the very very end of the 70s when I was 17 years old the women's liberation movement and in particular the anti-male violence movement was really quite energetic and as an uneducated uh, you know girl who'd never read a book you know they spoke to me really clearly because they didn't use academic lingo they didn't try to complicate things it was that women have a really rough deal out of life and we need to resist this. And the way that women are kept down is because the lived reality of all of us across the planet and the only thing that unites us all is that fear and reality of male violence. You know, we're different, otherwise we're so different. But that really spoke to me, having seen and witnessed male violence in my young life. And so I went on to, um, to become an active campaigner and further down the line, met with women um, involved in prostitution or who had got out um, of the life and, and who, from whom I learned about how men's view of women can often be played out in, in ways that really hurt us. Um, and one of those systems, um, I believe, is prostitution. And what I really liked about the, um, the women that I met the feminists and the women who had had direct experience of prostitution was that nobody, nobody was looking to the women for any blame or culpability whatsoever. This was not about looking at the women and their choices or lack of choice. It was asking why we live in a society where men want to purchase one-sided sexual consent with women. Um, and, and that's how I started. And that, that's what I've been doing all my adult life. I got into academic research, which I then left um, in early 2000s to do full-time reporting. And so I do investigative journalism and I write books on feminism. Okay, thank you. Um, Pina? So I read your book as well because I did not know about you and I uh, had no introduction to your work. But uh, the last time we spoke in the matter of three days, I did read your book with all the work that I had to do. So the point that I want to say is I agree with most of what you say, but there will always be women who will be in this profession. So how do we help them? I agree. I 
I agree to all the stories that how the system eats itself and a 12 year old boy, uh, father takes him to have sex in the Netherlands. I have read all the anecdotes and believe me, I have had, like I've been researching about sexuality for uh, the last 12 years speaking to different people and I remember one of the first times I got in touch with uh, uh, sex workers was back in Calcutta. Uh, we had uh, with Rotary because my parents were involved we did a, a little uh, AIDS awareness thing which my parents went to when I was very young in a place called Shonardachi. If you've done your research, you know how big and exploitative Shonargachi is. Mm -hmm. So something about, and I did not even understand who those women were. And later on, if you know about uh, the Hindustani classical music, you know about the Tawaif culture in the Urdu society, the Tawaifs were educated women like Bega Mahtar. So my father would listen to uh, Indian classical music and then my grandmother told me that, oh, there was. So suddenly everything started tumbling together and the women at Sonar Gachi and everything started to, you know, just come up in my consciousness, reading books, reading Simone de Beauvoir. I'm an avid reader as well and a writer. So then I started working recently with a lady who wrote a script on prostitutes. The film is on Netflix. And I actually went to Kamatipuram and actually interacted with a whole bunch of women. And like back in the days, 10 years ago, I was already on Google Groups, on Facebook, speaking to women of different countries about sexuality, about uh, prostitutes, essentially, because because I was researching, I've always been researching Inanna Ishtar and that's how I got to the, the sacred prostitutes and the, the enactment of Inanna Ishtar and uh, the whole idea of uh, women being sacred. And I think that's what patriarchy did. They took away the sacredness of touch. In fact, that is what I teach because I am also a Reiki practitioner. So I understand uh, your point that how in prostitution touch has become toxic. Whereas touch is everything for humanity. We release oxytocin as we touch another human being. So I, after reading your book, I agree with everything you say uh, about state run brothels and their, how redundant they are about how women are exploited. The Johns, that was a very interesting part. And you know, the, the research you did on the Johns and the punters as you call them. So I agree, but there will always be women. So how, as Karl Marx said, if you do not end capitalism, you do not end prostitution. So, I mean, we live in an exploitative society. How do we abolish and rehome all these women in Kamatipuram, all these women in Shonargachi? Uh, three days ago, I just got a video that uh, speaks about the plight of these women now in the post-COVID world. So, you know, I want to reach out to them. I want to help them in some way. My work is with the women. I am not concerned about anything. My work is to tell them they are valid. They are goddesses in their own right, that I respect them because, you know, in, in Tantra, you respect the goddess. And another very interesting thing that I want to tell you is I am a Bengali and we have something really big called Durga Puja. So when the Brahmin starts to make the Durga idol, the first thing he did, the first lump of clay comes from the home of a prostitute. So this is a tradition that is thousands of years old. Okay, the first lump of clay must come from the home of a, a, a living prostitute. So there are symbolisms here. There are stories and anecdotal evidence that we have lost what uh, matriarchy, in, in the time of matriarchy, there, there were these women who would heal with this power. So now because of the, the patriarchal dominance, the power has been taken from them.
and the touch that was healing has become toxic so as i support you what next how do we help these women what do we do and uh as kiara and we were talking that we need to help these people in some way come together whether you want to abolish the the system you must understand that some women are too poor or some women will just get into it i've had girls who uh, open up uh, profiles in seeking arrangement or uh, any other website looking for uh, sugar daddies because they they think that it is a valid uh, income and some of them are happy and some of them are not so i mean how my interest is with the woman okay you decide to get into it now what how can i support you you know i don't want to judge the women i don't want to say that whether i want to abolish the system i'm not a sex worker you know so i've had women tell me that that you are just gathering a research do you know the life mm-hmm. and to that i say that i have been on seeking arrangement talking to the men is a different picture so i've got pages and pages of research on how men and women are interacting which i plan to publish in a book called pussy talks okay uh, yeah okay so you know jill please um go ahead and hi hi kiara th- and you and and both of you it's so nice to meet you both thank you for having me as you said i'm a professor i um am a researcher and i guess i'm um, i'm really i'm really enjoying hearing both b- what both of you guys are saying i i actually came to this initially as a researcher and then very quickly came to this as an activist and one of the things that i have talked about i was just thinking julie when you talked about your history and how you came to this right in terms of basically women having this similar experience of fear of violence that men can you know perpetuate and do perpetuate against women and when i came to this i you know researchers get a lot of flack as they should in my opinion for not giving back to the communities in which they research we make our we make our careers off of you know learning from and with different communities and so very early on i was asked by robin few one of the founders of swap usa to be on the founding board of swap usa and i happened to do um accounting and was their treasurer for a very long time but but what i think was impactful for me about that was that i just wanted to give back and say okay sure let me let me give back in some way but what ended up happening was i ended up hanging out with a lot of sex workers and absolutely privileged sex workers right if you were going to organize in many ways you have to have privilege you have to have computers and phones and time and all of that kind of thing but i hung out with a lot of people and i learned a lot about prostitution and sex work from a very different perspective than i would have as a researcher i also spent a lot of time hanging out with people who were working on the street hanging out with people who were working in clubs hanging out with you know in different contexts i've spent time in new zealand did a research project in new zealand which was very interesting 15 years after they decriminalized prostitution so i think what is framed a lot of my perspective because i'm definitely identify as a feminist and a researcher and a sex worker rights advocate and one of the things that has for me and one of the questions that i have in in all of this context is this idea about human rights and how can we talk about prostitution and talk about all of these the exploitation and we live in a patriarchal exploitative society and so one of the things that i tend to do is look at it from a human rights perspective and say okay how can we how can we as tina says honor the women respect the people not just women men trans people all kinds of people are selling sex and choosing to sell sex and there is absolutely a continuum of choice we know there is a continuum of choice right and one of the things that i advocate for again and again is creating the conditions whereby and i don't think we're going to overturn capitalism tomorrow but creating the conditions whereby these exploitation these exploitations are not continuing to happen. So some of what we're seeing with the COVID relief funds with the Black Lives Matter and it's not there yet, right? But all of these things are basically saying we need justice. We need to find justice. So I look for things that are not in criminalization of either party or any parties except for those that are 
purposefully exploitative, right? When we look at force fraud and coercion and trafficking, not looking at that kind of criminalization, but looking at how can we build up people's human rights? How can we build up so that if they don't wanna be in prostitution and sex work, then let's find other options. Let them find other options. But criminalization, and I can talk later about this if you want, criminalization of both parties, in my opinion, increases the harms exponentially and it's incredibly problematic and so that's kind of where i come to this whole conversation from okay julie in a minute i'm going to ask you to speak but i just wanted to add something um i would like to look at it as a sex worker as you would look at the problem with colonialism and um i can't see uh, colonialism sorry um colonialism and and black brown all, all all every every other color other the other colors other than white who have been um persecuted it's it goes back to the same thing with sex workers well, lbgt all this because up until the 1200s or in the middle medieval time it wasn't really it wasn't a big thing to be a homosexual or lesbian or, or or whatever because it was still a part of life even in your um indigenous people of the land they had one two they had more than five six seven genders yeah yeah yes. so sex and they even had gods who were who were gods who were specific for non-procreative sex so sexuality to me is is is, is what the the issue is when we start curing sexuality is is how we're going to get to this point because we can't criminalize the men either because not all men are doing that I will say that the brothels, I do not like them. I've gone just to see what it was like and didn't like it. I hated it. I agree with you 100%. No brothels. But go ahead. Well, I'm just so glad we're having this conversation because it's so often just screaming at each other um, <laughs> and not listening. And I so appreciate this dialogue. So thank you again. Um, I just want to speak to a couple of, of, of things, first of all, that, that Tina said. Um, obviously, you know, you when you use terms like the toxic touch, it just makes me think about the misogyny towards the women or any person selling sex when that's an abhorrence. And the toxic touch is the touch of the police officer, obviously, the touch of the violent John, um, and not from her um, ever or any prostituted person. And I suppose I should have said in my introduction about my position on this, in terms of the law, I'm really well aware of what goes on in the States. It, it's, it's unbelievably horrific that prostituted people or sex workers, whichever terminology we wish to use, are criminalized ever in any way under any circumstances yeah they, do the, same here. they do the same here they, they oftentimes yes. you will see yeah. in tv raids we have these young women so many of them are nepali girls tibetan mm -hmm. girls please okay. just go wanna, and fix them up in kamatipuram they pay sure. these girls for nothing and they have bed bugs because i went in they have bed bugs tina it's, tina, it's tina. horrific Tina, sweetie. Okay, we're going to let her finish talking and then you go. Okay, go ahead, I'm Julie. Yes, and I, and I spent time in, uh, in the court, in the, uh, the Queen's district, um, trafficking courts where uh, they're still criminalizing uh, the people in prostitution who are arrested from the brothels and their pimps stand outside in the court waiting to just put them back, uh, you know, straight on the game again. And, and it's an abhorrence and it shouldn't happen in any country anywhere. And if I had one wish and I could, I could just have what I wanted in terms of the human rights relating to the entire global sex trade before any buyer is criminalized, I would say decriminalize all the prostituted people, every single person selling sex everywhere in the world. It never works. 
it's a human rights violation uh, of, of the worst example and it's ineffective in the extreme um, but I also want to to just say something that Tina said about the women here and now in Sonagachi, wherever, because obviously there's a huge amount of poverty in the sex trade, as everyone knows, and a huge amount of coercion. Um, and what, what I think is a human rights approach to women who cannot feed their children or themselves and are in the here and now, well, two things. First of all, offer any harm reduction, harm minimization that that person wants and needs and that that person asks for. Ideology should never, ever come before the safety of the person selling sex. And the second thing is something that a sex trade survivor colleague of mine said that I, I used in, in the book in response to Kenneth Roth, um, who is the high, very highly paid white privileged head of Human Rights Watch who, when Amnesty International was arguing about whether or not it adopts a blanket policy of decriminalization of the entire trade, clearly that means brothels and pimping as well as the person selling sex, he said, look, you know, I understand that some people don't like prostitution, think that women are harmed by it, but why would you remove that option for, and effectively he was saying black and brown women, um, for whom there's no other option of making money? And, and my sex trade survivor colleague said, well, I think the thing to do, Kenneth, when a woman is hungry, is to put food in her mouth and not your cock. And I think that there's something to be said for that, that we don't, we don't take away the, any right or choice of a woman to earn her money in the sex trade, but we also recognise the level of coercion and poverty within that sex trade and the lack of any viable alternative. Oh yeah. Okay, can, excuse and in me. India um, there is one. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead, mommy. Go ahead, Tina. And then so I'll... there is this really no support. Even the NGOs that go forward, it's always about a condom or about just talking about you know how to stay away from STDs or uh, basics. There's never any psychological, spiritual, emotional support. So, you know, even women who've come to me, who you know, been desperate and they just had no other way. And yes, they suffer. But again, what do they do? We are in such an exploitative system. For some people, it's just, just no way out. Some women have regular jobs. They, they still go on websites. They still get that few one, two, three sugar daddies just to tie them by so they can pay for their kids. It's come to that right now, okay. and the women that I were that I talk to, they are phoning me, they are messaging me. There is no food, there are no johns, there is nothing post COVID. There is not camp cam work for every girl. Most of a lot of poor women don't even know how to get online. All they have is stand on the road and kolaba. So what do we do about that? How can we criminalize them? If they get picked up, they're going to get hurt by the police. And you spoke about that in the book, that uh, people from economically backward or developing countries, the police is horrific. So the women forget, I am not a sex worker. If I get raped, I'm going to think 10 times before I even go to the police. So... I mean, we are living in a system that I work in the film industry. There are there's so much of exploitation going on in, in that zone. Think about that. We've got all this uh, Epstein and all the children and all these. Like, can you imagine what they're doing? Adrenochrome, they, they hunt. So, I mean, this is like stuff that a, a normal person like me can't even think of. Okay. So all I can think of is, is in some way finding a safe haven for these women so they don't have to stand on the street. They don't, they, they have food. So, you know, to me that it always boils down to this, that there will be women who will do it. There will be women who will push to do it. Some of them by necessity, some of them by karma is what I call it because they are reincarnated. For instance, I think Kiara, because she is so secure in, in what she does. 
in a sense, she is probably reincarnated. I believe in reincarnation and the soul carrying on uh, the work. So how do we define what a tawaif did and how do, it's not the same as what a sex worker does today? So the whole concept has shifted from the, the sacred prostitutes of Greece and Rome and Sumer. It's, it's, it's a change. These women Egypt. think they have nowhere to go. Nothing to do. They Egypt, hate Africa, them. all those places had it. South America, Central America, all these places. Um, a pre In India, we pre had uh, the Dastis. Yeah. Pre-colonial pre times were um, more interested in the person's spirit than their sexuality. And that's what we've lost. We've, right. we, we, we've lost that by this, um, uh, this hetero... Oh, over yeah, the patriarchy hetero, patriarchy yeah, patriarchy yeah, patriarchy. yeah, and, and it, the, the whole Eurocentric, um, a heterosexual, um, norm, yeah, normalcy, it's been lost there, but it's not completely lost because we, we know about this. And we, um, my thing is, and why I created this platform is because I want the normal public, because it is the masses and is the public that they beguile with all these stereotypes about sex workers because in every study i don't care how much you to research you have you don't have enough money to truly research every single sex worker because there's at least 20 sex workers that i know who as she say you can say they're incarnated priestesses because they are very secure in what they're doing but they're not they're not ready to be me and be out with it there is a problem with being out with it. Since I've been out with it, I've had my son torn from me for 12 years for being a sex worker. And that led me to drink, go smoke crack, go all these things. But my son, the thought of my son and me being something that is not me, led me back to where I am today. So, but in the process, when I met a lot of junkies and a lot of these people, I was um I was I was talking to them and so forth and a lot of their drug use came from being molested or some kind of abuse during childhood. The end result was prostitution to get money and then because of the stigma that sex carries they couldn't get come out of it cuz now they're more ashamed because now they're in in something sexual. So it's a it's vicious. If you don't have that kind of spirit or character or, or whatever you want to call it I think part of my upbringing had something to do with it being that my mom is so strong but she's very religious um, and this shamed her but now she understands better you understand but, uh, but by, by watching how this very religious woman can now have a homosexual grandson and a uh, whore and I mean that as beloved one not um, in the ugly sense, could be her daughter and continue to do so and she will stand by me now when she wouldn't stand by me before. But it came because I had to stand strong on what I felt. And by explaining to her and seeing her, I, I think that by educating the public truthfully, we can... We, we can help people, but first we have to get past the stigma of sex because that is the biggest block between any help. Because people in my industry feel ashamed of what they're doing even though they love what they're doing because of the sex stigma. Go ahead, um, Jill. Well, I, I want to address, um, I, I really appreciate you saying that. And I also want to address this idea of criminalization because I think criminalization feeds stigma and discrimination, right? And so if we are trying to talk, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly, I don't think that we can just ignore this idea of sacred sexuality. And I don't think that we should ignore that. And I think that criminalization in any way, I wholeheartedly agree with you, Julie, I don't think that people who choose to sell sex should ever be criminalized. I don't think that people who choose to buy sex should be criminalized. I think that if we put people in boxes and say, well, men are always violent and always trying to be exploitative. Yes, historically, in general, 
men masculinity has been violent and exploitative and that is a huge problem but i don't know that the criminal boxes that we've created around prostitution are actually helping people i think they're hindering absolutely the people who are choosing to sell the sex workers they're absolutely hurting them and they're hurting the people who are buying and their families the people that are choosing to buy the clients so to speak um, are, are they're hurting them. And so I think it's really important to look at these overlying structures that we have built that come as a product of colonization, that come as a product of patriarchy, that come as a product of misogyny and all of these things and say, okay, how do we get back to some kind of basic trust and love and connection? And part of me honestly strongly believes that decriminalization of prostitution as a legislative policy is the closest thing that we can get to creating a space for human rights and the closest thing, closest thing that we can get for honoring individuals and the choices or lack of choices that they make. Because when things are decriminalized, then they have more options to go to the police, to go to whoever may need to be supportive. And we can start working against, it doesn't take it away 100%, but we can start working against this huge layer of stigma and discrimination, which we criminalize something that we think is wrong. We criminalize things that are immoral. And choosing to exchange sex in lots of different capacities is not necessarily immoral. And we don't, I don't have the right to tell people what is moral and immoral when they are adults and they are choosing and they are consenting, even if they're not choosing from the most best area of opportunity and privilege. I understand that, right? And I'm very privileged, so I get that. But I don't have the right to say that what you are doing is wrong and immoral. And I just, I wanna, because Julie, I know we have very different perspectives. I do wanna bring this this um, topic of criminalization up because it's one of the things that feminists are so hugely divided on. And I think we have to be able to talk about this very truthfully and very honestly and say, how can we best support people? And for me, having been in, in New Zealand for three months and done an in-depth Fulbright study and also just doing research and talking to people for 20 years, I feel like decrim is the closest that we can get to trying to fight some of these huge overarching injustices and problems in our society. When it comes Most to of us would have sure. rather money than tangible wealth. And a great occasion is somehow spoiled for us unless photographed. And to read about it the next day in the newspaper is oddly more fun for us than the original event. This is a disaster. For as a result of confusing the real world of nature with mere signs, we are destroying nature. We are so tied up in our minds that we've lost our senses. Time to wake up. What is reality? Obviously, no one can say because it isn't words.